Yeah. But that's, of course, a very rich area of your life, isn't it, that? Because rich in the terms of nostalgia we're talking about. Because you've written five books about your war experiences. Yeah. It must have been a deeply traumatic time for you. It was traumatic, but at the same time, I had this benefit of meeting blokes that have been my friends ever since. I know any one of these blokes, I could knock on his door at night and say, can I sleep here the night? And he'd say, piss off. <laughs> No, they were, they, were, they were great, great, great friends and some extraordinary things, you know. Uh, the heroism is a strange thing. I'll, I'll give you an example of what a British, British squaddy is like. I don't think any British squaddy is quite, quite brave, but he, he doesn't like being beaten. He doesn't like being, having to move out of the hole he's dug. That's what kept him there. For instance, I'll give you an example of a chap called Ronnie Mayo, who's our cook in, in Italy. And it was the time he's getting the dinner ready for the night time. We, we were all in the camouflage nets and the guns were here. And they were just bringing up ammunition lorries with the covers on. As we were getting ready for the dinner, he got it all laid out. The Germans lobbed about 10 88 millimeter shells. And one of the, 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 the cover of this lorry caught fire. That was ammunition on board. So with great courage, I ran into a slit trench. And uh, <laughs> we're all in the hole in the ground. And suddenly I heard this lorry start up. And this was the chef. He got into the lorry and drove it down the bottom of the hill. Fortunately, the, it, didn't, it didn't explode. He came back and I said, God, Ronnie, what did you do that for? He said, well, I, I don't want to cook the bleeding dinner twice, did I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing, that, isn't it? Extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did, you, did you find it uh, easy remembering all that period, or did it involve an awful lot of, of help from other people? Oh, I kept diaries. You did? Yeah, I all kept a diary. Mm. And, uh, I, of course, I chatted with the lads who fill in the empty space that I couldn't find out about it. And I read prolifically about the war and things like that. Mm. In fact, I was just reading a book yesterday called uh, Gunners at War. And in it, they mentioned that uh, the air observation post in North Africa, this air pay was actually firing a gun. They used to fly over the target and then wireless down what to shoot at. And I was in the gun position on the wireless there and it wasn't working well. And this plane came over, I heard it go over very low and shouting, Oi! Oi! So I got out and this pilot was circling around. He was eating an apple, like this. He said, your wireless is all balls. <laughs> More 400. That's the signal. And he flew off again. And that was me. It was, and it was mentioned in this book, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I told you to stay tuned. <laughs> to the station. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, stay tuned, because we're going to take a break now. A break? And come back More like in... a fracture, isn't it? <laughs> 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 I could see you talking to Spike. Back in two takes. See you right. there. Welcome back. Our special guest is Gunnar Milligan. Spike, uh, still in the army situation, did you in fact, because you're the son of, a, of, an, uh, of an army man, did you in fact adapt to the army very easily? Yes, you because I, I was with the cadet corps in Rangoon at, at the Christian Brothers de La Salle. There was a cadet corps and when I was 14, I was in the 14th Machine Gun Company, 3rd Field Brigade, Auxiliary Force India. And I was a very good shot, yes. Mm. So, mm. I mean, you, you naturally adapted into it. And I enjoyed, got in very easily. Yeah, yes, I liked it. I enjoyed it. I must mm. say, I did enjoy it, yeah. In fact, I mean, Adolf Hitler um, it had, had a profound effect in your career, didn't he? I mean, as a writer and... Well, without him, I wouldn't have done. I'd still been a semi-skilled fitter in Woolwich Arsenal. Yeah. 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 You never got to meet <laughs> him. the way him, things though. are going, I could be a semi-skilled fitter. <laughs> <laughs> did you have much contact with the Germans and the, and the enemy in the time you were in the army? Well, it's a famous story. I think I might have told you this. Uh, uh, we were, the English officer always baffled me. I didn't know whether he was brave or acting brave. And there was a nice officer called Bowman Smythe, and he said, we're going to go, we just advanced in an area, and we were looking for an observation post, and we'd gone past the German lines or something, and they're into enemy territory, and we didn't know it. And I was in this brain carrier driving him, and he got out, and he's standing with this map, and I was in there, and I heard a noise behind me, and I looked around, and there was three German paratroopers with their hands up like this. So I started to look for this Tommy gun. <laughs> and uh, the book of instructions on how to, how to work it. So I got out and I said to them, very silly, because they had them up already, I said, hand hock! <laughs> hand up! I said, so this officer didn't look around. He said, what's, what's going on, Milligan? I said, there's three German uh, paratroopers here, sir. He said, well, ask them what they want. <laughs> so I, I said, well, they, uh, they want to surrender, sir. He said, well, tell them we haven't got the facilities. <laughs> How do we win? How do we win? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's absurd, isn't it? I mean, it was, yeah. in all that horror and all that yeah. terror, the sort of capacity you still had to actually sort of see the funny side of it. What, what other favourite memories do you have of it? You know, the funny moments of that war? Uh, the, uh, the other one was, uh, I was shaving behind a hill under a camouflage net in Two Tree Hill in North Africa. 
and we had a bucket of hot water. And I had all lathered up here like this. And suddenly I heard what would sound like a tank. Tick, 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 tick. So we all got the laundry problem right away. And, uh, we... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, around the corner, early morning mist, it's about 20, 50 yards away from around this hill, came this single, uh, this half-track German vehicle with a German driver uh, whistling. <laughs> so immediately the uh, this uh, chap in the mortar pit lobbed two phosphorus mortars and the, the thing, uh, the, the cab caught fire where he was and his trouser leg caught fire and he was trying to put his hands up at the same time <laughs> with this, and uh, being sportish they shot the shit out of this poor bloke and I realised that he, I, I got this bucket of water and ran over at him and forgetting it was boiling hot threw it over his leg. <laughs> 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 mad, mad, mad days. <laughs> Dear, wonderful. Because the answer, you, you did a bit of work for that, didn't you, in the in your army? No, I, I got to, uh, everybody knows this now, I got wounded at a place called Mount Dimiano and got sent back down the line to a place called the Central Pool of Artists. And these were soldiers who could do, if they would do any turns or juggling or singing or something like this, they used to put them into a concert party and send them around for the troops. And that's how I got into that, so I met Harry Seacombe. Yeah, and that's the real start of the goons and all that. Yeah. Let's have a, we've got a, a, a clip, actually, of the, of the last goon show ever recorded, which I'd like to...